Welcome back to the land of the living, Sebastian Ziani de Ferranti. Where am I? Who are you? I'm your guide to the 1980s. We can't let you ghosts wander around willy-nilly. All hell would break loose. Oh, nothing uh, personal, old chap. The 80s? But that's 50 years after my death. Quite right. Different time, but same place. Look around you. This is the company you set up as a young man, and which still bears your name. My company? But what are they making? Semi-custom integrated circuits. I beg your pardon? You'll find out soon enough. But first of all, let's introduce you. Sebastian Ferranti. Half English, half Italian, a brilliant engineer. One of the first. In 1882, when you were just 23, you built the world's first power station in South London. You designed from scratch every electrical component, transformers, relays, fuses, then you sold them the world over. It seems that you were ahead of your time. You had a dream that one day the whole country would be wired up to provide cheap electricity for all. Yes, it was my life's ambition. Well, you were right. Those power lines carry enormous energy around the country, concentrating at great cities like Manchester in North England. Manchester, where I built my first factory. They thought my idea was dangerous, mad. But to be cheap, electricity must be carried at high voltage. Mad and dangerous. <laughs> where would they all be now without it? Electricity is like a spirit a powerful ally, but like a spirit, it requires careful attention lest it turns against you. Quite right. And all that power is tamed here, in the control room. Well, actually, in the transformers. Oh, I recognize this. I invented the electricity meter, you know. That's one invention you won't get rid of. Things can be made cheap, but not free. Now, I've seen that name somewhere before. Well, apart from electricity, we also distribute something that even you never knew about. Television. Now, let's see you explain this. What a most singular machine. It produces sound and moving pictures, yet is smaller than a book. Could this be... I'll wager that this is a form of broadcasting. I predicted that too, you know. Yes? Yes. This metal tube will pick up a signal, an invisible electromagnetic signal filling the air for everyone to receive. But how does the screen work? They've made it so devilish small. Well, many things have happened since your death. Let's see what you make of this little lot. One of these screens again, bigger than the other one and in color. Is all this broadcast as well? No, this is not being transmitted. It's called up, just on one screen using the contraptions underneath. They look like typewriter keyboards. How are they running these pictures? Wait a minute. Could they be what we used to call analytical engines? Machines that use cogs and wheels to perform calculations? Go on, have a look inside. Oh, no wheels. Now, what do I recognize? These are resistors. Here are condensers. No, capacitors. The words changed, old chap. That's a tiny loudspeaker. But what are these? They're called transistors. And these spidery black boxes. They have an abundance of connections. They're clearly crucial. But what's inside them? How do they work? So, that's what my company's doing. This is worthy of further investigation. We call these things personal computers. This one uses the latest silicon chips made by your company to provide an immense power very cheaply. At the press of a button, you can get hours of entertainment 
patents such as these, games, music, calculations, the list is almost endless. They're used for work as well as play. This one does your tax bill. Oh dear. I wonder if it registers invisible earnings. But those chips aren't confined to making computers. They're ideal for helping to control machines. This high-speed drill, for instance. Or the exposure setting for a camera. A chip for every application. But strangely, all these chips are the same, though they may look different. The key to these silicon chips is the transistor. It was invented nearly 20 years after you died. Now, you probably didn't know that silicon could be made to conduct or that the transistor would combine two remarkable properties. Try testing the basic transistor circuit. Right. Now, I'll just use one simple tone to feed into the transistor. There we go. And now add a power supply at 5 volts into the other input. Goodness. Yes, I see. This transistor is a powerful amplifier. Rather like the vowels we used in my day. But I'll grant this is much better. And it's an automatic switch. On, off, on, off. All of its own accord. An electrical component that both switches and amplifies. But what if lots of them were wired together? The possibilities could be limitless. Limitless because as you make them smaller, you make them faster. Under an electron microscope, we can see thousands of miniature transistors switching or amplifying at enormous speed. Tiny electronic components no bigger than a pinhead. Each line is one hundredth the size of a human hair. The tighter you can fit the circuits together, the more the chip can do. This is a cross-section through one of the chip's transistors. The amazing thing about these circuits is that one chip can do the job of millions of old-fashioned amplifiers. Put enough chips together and you have what we call a mainframe computer. It's much more powerful than the home computers you saw earlier. A completely new sort of machine that uses information as its raw material and then processes it electronically. What's this box? It's a set of magnetic disks used by the computer to store information and programs. What, like a radio program? No, no, no. You see, although it's very fast, the computer can't do anything without a set of instructions called a program. That cabinet contains a central brain that reads the program and executes those instructions. Why are you opening it? I want to see how it works. But it's very sensitive. Don't touch anything inside. Look, we don't insure ghosts against damages. The premiums are out of this world. Please, relax. I built the world's first power station. I know what I'm doing. It's not just a single circuit board of a home computer, but a whole collection wired together. Yes, we use electricity to make an artificial brain. How ingenious of you. But what's this computer used for? It's used to design itself. <laughs> now you're trying to confuse me. This is the nerve center for anti-electronics in Manchester. They use the latest technology to prepare the intricate designs for their chips. These screens again. People must spend half their lives in front of them. And an electric writing tablet? The chip contains thousands of identical blocks, all made of transistors. The designer uses the red lines to specify how each block is wired up. So, different wiring means different chips. Here are all the blocks of a complete chip, a set of circuits for almost any application. It's like a made-to-measure suit that can be then adapted to fit any customer. So instead of slaving for 10,000 hours over chip design, your company does it in 10. That means these chips contain so many blocks of transistors that they need a computer full of chips to store the design for a new one. All we had in my day was paper and pencil. Well, if you want a paper copy, the computer does that too. Ah! 
It's almost magical. This large piece of paper contains the plan for a chip smaller than a fingernail. The plan will be miniaturized by the computer before manufacture. All this to be built on a fingernail. And this is the range of final products, all from the same basic circuits. They're wrapped in a material called plastic. All neatly wrapped in plastic tubes. Lead on guide, fascinating. But I'd like to know who buys these chips. Some of the Ferranti chips are sent to Dundee in Scotland. Here they're combined with other components to make the Sinclair Spectrum home computer. They produce 80,000 a month or one every four seconds and the computers are sent all over the world. It's still the kind of mass production that you would remember well. Yes, but with components such as these, it's a whole new world. The range of products beggars description. This is the new industrial revolution. What amazes me is how small it all is. It makes everything I built when electricity was just starting look clumsy and unwieldy. These are so elegant and compact. Vast factories manufacturing thousands of products that people need. Someone must be making a lot of money out of all this, considering how easy and therefore cheap these Ferranti chips are to design. Correct. Without those economies, home computers would have remained much more expensive. Now, all these people are testing the circuit boards, but I haven't seen anyone soldering them together yet. Ah, yes. Well, just look at this ingenious process. It should appeal to your sense of economy. Instead of making each connection individually, they dip the whole board in molten solder. Well, I know now what a computer is and that it uses chips. Next, I want to know how the chips themselves are made. Oh, you do, do you? Oh. So this is where the chips are made. I'm beginning to feel a bit more at home. Fifty years have seen a lot of changes, though. Take those ever-present screens. They're like extra eyes. But of course, being so small, chips must be very hard to make. How do you fabricate thousands of components on a fingernail? With considerable difficulty. You see that intricate maze of pipes and ducts? They carry supplies of clean air and water to the airtight rooms below. Silicon chips are so small that a single particle of dust would ruin them. They have to be made in clean areas and everyone who works there must wear dustproof overalls. They're everyone, that is, except uh, ghosts. This is a completely alien world to me. I might as well be on Mars. When I first looked in here, I thought it was a new kind of kitchen. Strange sinks, ovens, not a spot of dirt anywhere. Masses of machinery just to make this, a product smaller than a postage stamp. It's so tiny that you can only see what happens under a powerful microscope, magnified thousands of times. The bars running across it are thin strips of aluminium that connect transistors by the thousand. But first we have to start with blank silicon wafers. But the wafers are bigger than the chips, and they're totally the wrong shape. True, but each wafer will have dozens of chips made on it. They get loaded into these ovens, where they're baked for 30 minutes at 600 degrees in an atmosphere of pure oxygen. They come out afterwards with a thin coating of silicon oxide. But how do they get the circuit patterns onto the chips? We're coming to that. You see, there's a lot of complex chemistry needed to make these tiny circuits. So, to save money, they make all the chips on the same wafer at once? Yes. 
The design stored in the computer you saw is repeated for each chip. The chips on any particular wafer are identical. Ah, mass production using a repeating pattern. A most lucrative proposition. For a ghost, you are obsessed with cash. Well, it's all that matters in industry. Keep the overheads down. What's this? An automatic washing machine. Remember, here, dust is the root of all evil. I haven't lost you yet, have I? Of course you haven't. I was at the forefront of electronics in my day. Now the key to the whole process. This part of the clean area can only be lit by yellow light, because here is where the chips are coated with the kind of photographic film. It's baked on over a light grill and is now ready for its first layer of circuits. What's this glass plate for? That plate is a mask for that first layer for each chip on the wafer. It's inserted between an ultraviolet light and the wafer itself. Plate and wafer have to be aligned within a millionth of a meter. Now the photographic film is exposed. So the plate contains dozens of copies of the circuit designs I saw in the main computer room, but each one a fraction of the original size. Like all film, it has to be developed, and then they use very concentrated acids. What do they use acid for? The acid etches the exposed film and oxide layer off the wafer, but only where the film has been exposed to ultraviolet light. Now this leaves minute windows through the oxide layer to the pure silicon below, corresponding to the patterns on the glass plate. After the acid bath, the wafers are washed through twice with pure water. The acid is very dangerous, so great care is needed. When the acid is washed away, it's time for a quick spin in a high-speed centrifuge. But I don't see why they can't just write the circuit straight onto the wafer. Silica does not conduct electricity in its pure state, but it does when it's impure. Under the microscope, the etched areas show up in the lighter color, drawn with perfect precision through the oxide layer. These exposed shakes will now have an impurity diffused into them in another visit to the oven. For the first stage, the impurity is arsenic. Electric current can only pass through these tiny areas where the silicon is impure. They are the first connections for all the chip's transistors. Now the whole business has to be repeated four times more to continue building up the transistors onto the chips. So, the transistors are made from very thin layers of impure silicon sitting on top of each other. Each time the process is repeated, it adds a more intricate pattern on top of the one before. It's like a multi-layered sandwich. You still have sandwiches, don't you? Occasionally. But it's the way we bake these that make them so different. You see, this oven is where Ferranti's process diverges from everyone else's. The secret ingredient in the pudding. In the intense heat, a chemical reaction occurs and a fine layer of silicon crystals is allowed to grow on top of all the circuits built so far. It was originally developed at Bell Laboratories in America, but Ferranti is the only major chip manufacturer that can use it. It's proved too difficult for everyone else. Oh, good for us. In one step, this forms the third and final connection for all the transistors and seals the previous circuits underneath it. But there's another advantage too. Unlike other chips which have transistors that can only switch or amplify, the Ferranti chips can do both at once. Each of these squares corresponds to the basic block that the chip designer can use. The made-to-measure suit is now ready for final fitting. That fitting means joining the circular dots according to the wiring pattern. 
it's the only part of the whole process that the customer has to pay for. The design of the final mask that inscribes the chip's internal wiring pattern. All that's needed now is a trip through a machine that sprays the fine aluminium wiring onto the wafer surface. Here are four chips lying next to each other on the completed wafer. The size of the production run has no effect on cost. The wafers have now left the clean area. The end of the process is in sight. I see. They're aligned microscopically using this camera. And now? Ah, they're being scored with a very sharp set of blades. Wait a minute, though. It hasn't yet separated them from one another. There must be some further complex process they need to go through. No. After all this advanced technology, I can't believe it. What's the matter? She's using a rolling pin. She does know what she's doing, doesn't she? Calm down. She doesn't work for you now, you know. Now what? Another of those plastic sheets. They seem to be awfully popular these days. Oh, that's clever. The light heats up the sheet to make it flexible, and then air pumped underneath lifts and separates the chips. Well, to borrow from your newfangled language, I suppose you'd say that the wafer has finally been chipped. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, yes. Now look at this. The silicon chips are so complex and small that it's impossible for the whole batch to be perfect. The good ones have to be hand-picked from the failures. Remarkable. The machine does the work while the people supervise. I'm glad that even in the 1980s, lots of people are needed to keep the machines up to the mark. I'd venture to say that the grandparents of these people probably worked in Manchester's massive textile industry. These days, they're looking after machines that knit very different patterns. Ah, yes, but they don't knit these designs with cotton. A fine gold thread is used to join the chip to its holder. Gold, eh? A very suitable setting for such a precious jewel. And now the chip is ready to take on the world. Before it can do that, it requires a protective covering. For even when completed, chips don't like dust, damp or large variations in temperature. But if treated well, they'll stay working for many years. The black plastic cases are baked around the circuit, sealing the chip in. All that gets through are its metal connections. These will mesh with the circuit boards like the one used in the Sinclair Spectrum. You do remember the Sinclair Spectrum, the personal computer? Now, now where have you gone? This is the most important stage of the whole process, the automatic stamping machine. I mean, there's no point in hiding your light under a bushel. Indeed, it's about time I investigated the competition. Well, I suggest you go to Malmesbury in West England. Charming. But what are we here for? We are here to see how new businesses are setting up to challenge your own company. You don't need to have a complete manufacturing plant. Just design the masks and test the chips that come back what we used to call a cottage industry. So, this stout fellow is weaving a new chip pattern to send to the supplier. Now, wait a minute. No, he isn't. He's designing something completely different. Well, come on, you're supposed to be my guide. What exactly is going on? I warn you, you're not going to like it. This man is not a chip designer. He's a scientist working on an entirely new approach to the way chips can be wired. 
Like the Ferranti chip, this one contains blocks of circuits that can be wired together in an almost infinite number of ways. Well, my company can do that. Ah, but he's designed new blocks. They can be adapted according to the designer's needs. This saves space on the chip and adds great flexibility for the designer. Well, I suppose it has some applications. Perhaps we could do a deal. It's an ingenious idea, but only one of many that Ferranti will have to contend with as chips advance almost every week. It's the chip of the future. Here is the first batch back from the supplier, and this machine is used for testing them. I say, a complete laboratory at your fingertips. If only I had all this in my day, yet we'd hardly heard of electronics 50 years ago.